Hey everybody, Steve here in Virginia at Mount Pillar, President James Madison and Dolly Madison's estate, mansion, and plantation. The Madisons are buried here on their family property, and my main reason for coming here today is to visit their grave sites. There's also a slave cemetery here, so I'm hoping to visit both of these historic graveyards. James Madison was born on March 16, 1751, in Port Conway, Virginia, which was still British America at the time. He lived to be 85 years old, dying on June 28, 1836, here at Montpelier, Virginia. His cause of death was heart failure. Madison was the fourth president of the United States and one of the founding fathers of the country, serving from 1809 until 1817. He's also known as the father of the Constitution for his prominent role in creating and promoting it. Madison was born into a wealthy slave-owning family and during his lifetime owned more than a hundred slaves himself. As I mentioned in my recent video about President Andrew Jackson, 12 U.S. presidents owned slaves during their lifetimes, and eight of those presidents owned slaves while they were serving in the White House, and that includes President James Madison. Doing a little bit of research prior to this visit, I discovered something pretty surprising and even shocking. Reportedly, the very first presidential memoir was written about James Madison by one of his slaves. In 1865, Paul Jennings' memoir, titled A Colored Man's Reminiscences of James Madison, was published. But that's not even the truly shocking and surprising part. I only recently learned that Paul Jennings was one of James Madison's slaves while he was in the White House. Jennings was born into slavery at Montpelier, and once he reached a certain age, he became Madison's personal body servant. When Madison became president and moved into the White House, he brought many of his slaves with them, including Paul Jennings. It turns out that this was not at all uncommon back then among the eight presidents who owned slaves while they were serving in the White House. Not only that, but I also recently learned that the White House was built almost entirely by black slave labor. I find it astonishing and almost unbelievable that I never heard about this in American history classes while I was growing up. At first I thought, well, maybe I just wasn't paying attention or I just missed it somehow. So I asked a few friends who were around the same age as me if they learned about this in history class and none of them had ever heard about slaves in the White House or that the White House had been built by slaves either. If something this important could be left out of history books or minimized, it makes me wonder what else was left out. This is the view of the Madison's mansion from the backside and just a short distance to the left of the house are the slave dwellings or quarters. The sign indicates that this was primarily a tobacco plantation, and these dwellings are much newer and definitely an upgrade to the homes where the slaves typically lived that just had dirt floors and were often just built by hand by the slaves themselves. Let's go inside and uh, take a look around. I'll zoom in so you can pause the video if you want to read this. So let's walk over to the slave cemetery next, which according to the map is on the way to the Madison's family cemetery and grave sites. So the sign here says that the slave cemetery is this direction. So let's go see. I love to walk, so this is good for me, but if you're not a walker, if you don't like walking, or if you're not able to walk, this might be a little bit difficult. I've been saying on this channel for years that one of the reasons I enjoy visiting cemeteries and gravesites so much is that I'm able to learn so much about history. And a lot of it is history that's never taught in schools. Slave cemetery. Is this it? Not even marked? Not even any stones, headstones. Wow. Very sad. But a beautiful location. With just nameless slaves buried here on the property. Wow. A gravesite without a headstone to remember who was buried there, when they were born, when they died, and other information about their life is a personal piece of history that's been lost. I wondered if Paul Jennings was buried here, so I checked Find a Grave, and to my surprise, I wasn't able to find a Find a Grave memorial page for him at all. I did discover that he was born in 1799 here on this plantation in Virginia, and he died in 1874 in Washington, D.C., at the age of 75. He was originally buried at Columbian Harmony Cemetery in Washington, D.C., 
But the cemetery was closed in 1959, and the many distinguished black citizens buried there were moved to National Harmony Memorial Park in Maryland. It's located just 12 miles east of the White House. Sadly, many of the remains went unclaimed by family, and they were all reburied or reinterred in a mass grave at the new cemetery. And you probably guessed it, one of the bodies buried in that mass grave was that of Paul Jennings, a popular author and possibly the most famous slave to ever work in the White House. The shameful treatment and disrespect that he was forced to endure while he was alive sadly continued beyond the grave. I hope the mass grave at least has a memorial marker, but I wasn't able to find a photo or any information about it online at all. Let's see what this informational kiosk says. Hidden under the periwinkle before you are about 40 ground depressions. We believe these depressions represent the last burials of enslaved people to have taken place at Mount Pillar, after which no community members re remain to tend the graves and fill in the earth as it settled. The graves were marked only with field stones, a few of which are still visible. And this quote reads, I trust she has gone to a world where sorrow and suffering are no more. Paul Jennings to Dolly Madison, August 6, 1844, on the death of his wife, Fanny. There's no evidence of a wall, fence, or other demarcation where the cemetery ends and the surrounding wood begins. We do not know how many individuals were buried here or what their names were, but there is strong evidence that most of those who died while enslaved by the Madisons came to rest here. The graves had been left as they were found undisturbed. Rediscovering the cemetery. No oral history of the cemetery survived as Mount Pillar passed through the hands of several owners after Dolly Madison sold the plantation in 1844. In 1987, soon after the National Trust for Historic Preservation acquired Mount Pillar, a study of the property indicated that this was a cemetery for the enslaved. A ground penetrating radar survey completed in 2018 revealed that these 40 graves comprise only a small portion of the cemetery, which stretches. 180 feet into the field behind you and may include as many as 250 graves. The Montpelier Foundation is working closely with the descendants of those enslaved at Mount Pillar to determine the most appropriate way to interpret and memorialize the cemetery. Their voices will guide any decisions regarding possible archaeological investigations of the site and future plans to memorialize those whom history has forgotten. Okay, now let's walk over just a short distance over to the Madison Family Cemetery. So leading up to the gate here, there's this plaque that says Madison Family Cemetery, restored through the vision and generosity of the Virginia Daughters of the American Revolution, dedicated October 28th, 2000. And look at this, this looks original. Unfortunately, most of these headstones are so old and whatever they were made of, the names have just been eroded. It's almost impossible to read most of them which is sad, and I'm surprised they don't have some kind of a plaque out here saying who's here and where they're located. That would be nice. But there's James Madison's monument, and Dolly Madison's smaller monument is right behind him. And this is the property, very quiet out here, very nice. It's much more low key than Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. I just came from there about an hour or so ago. That one is kind of over the top. I mean, in a good way, as far as it's more like an amusement park. I mean, there were just thousands of people there visiting. But it's a lot less crowded here, at least today. Just inside the graveyard gate, to the right, is a plaque commemorating the War of 1812, which was declared by Madison and Congress and became an important part of his presidency. As I mentioned earlier, James Madison lived to be 85 years old, while Dolly Madison lived to be 81 years old. When they married, he was 43 years old and 17 years older than her. She outlived him by 13 years, dying on July 12, 1849, but she didn't die here. She died in Washington, D.C. After her husband died, Dolly Madison was forced to sell Montpelier to pay the bills. And by the time she died, she was living in poverty. After the president died, Paul Jennings became Dolly Madison's personal servant. But once again, in order to raise money to survive, she sold Jennings to another slave owner. Fortunately, Senator Daniel Webster purchased Jennings from the new slave owner and finally set him free. Jennings continued to work for Webster, 
and both men ended up helping Dolly Madison financially in her final years. Obviously, there was a lot of affection shared between the Madisons and Jennings. I'm guessing that it was pretty uncommon for a former slave to financially help to support his former slave owner. While slavery was shameful and despicable in every way, it's kind of interesting to learn that at least some slave owners and slaves were able to reconcile the relationship once slavery was abolished. No matter how well some slaves may have been treated by their owners, it still can never justify one person enslaving another person. I hope that one day Paul Jennings will have his own headstone with his name on it, and maybe even a statue like James and Dolly Madison's statue. Like Alfred Jackson at the Hermitage, Paul Jennings and his important place in American history deserves to be remembered just like the Madisons deserve to be remembered. If he does already happen to have a headstone or a statue somewhere that I'm not aware of, please let me know. This week I want to give a shout out and a very big thank you to my newest channel supporters, Mike H, Sandy with an I, Kieran Baugh, Zing Wilder, Stone Thug Music, Jenny Asher, Rick O'Leary, Matthew Woodworth, and Michael Haley. Thank you all so much for your extra generous donations to my channel using Patreon and YouTube Super Thanks. Your donations are very appreciated and mean a lot. So thank you for joining me on another road trip to the past and until our next trip to the cemetery together. Thanks for sharing the memories, everybody.